here tonight. Um, I would like to start by asking you all to mute yourselves and by letting you know that the following session is being recorded. If you wish to not be recorded, that's not a problem. Just turn your camera off. Um, my name is Cecily O, oh, and I'm the current operations manager at SAR Gallery. We're very happy to be able to host this artist talk online tonight with Cyrus Marcus Ware and Cristian Ordonez for the People United exhibition currently on view at SAR Gallery. But before I continue, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which SAR Gallery is placed um, is on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Hiram Wendat. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga of the Credits First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. Today, the meeting place of Tacaronto is home to many indigenous nations um, from across Turtle Island, and we're very grateful to have the opportunity as immigrants to this land to work and present here. I also want to acknowledge government arts funding, all of which supports our vision for a more diverse art scene in Toronto. So I would like to thank the Canadian Council for the Arts through their Digital Now program, Canadian Heritage through Community Support, Multiculturalism and Anti-Racism Initiatives Events Component, the Ontario Arts Council, the Toronto Art Council, and the City of Toronto through Section 37. I would also like to thank our sponsors, um, Ready to Post, and our videographer, Hofworks Productions. I will now pass it over to Tamara Toledo, the director and curator of Sir Gallery. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. So the artist stimulating and provocative work in the exhibition I have curated, The People United, offer proposals that tackle the power of people, the hope that their unity can lead to as we dream for a better future, a more humanitarian one. All of the artists involved in this exhibition take on very different approaches and different methodologies. They come from different backgrounds and different locations, and they also adopt different mediums. But all of them capture and understand the essence and process of struggle, the humanity behind those masses that create change, and the hope that we can build new transformative ways of thinking and of doing. And I place these artists and collectives together in a dialogue between those who live in diaspora and those who live in the global south. I believe these artists can provide not only a lens from which to view things differently, but they can also lend a mirror for us to witness the potential within all of us. And so to show um, our, our own abilities to, to make change. So I have the pleasure tonight to introduce two of those uh, Toronto-based artists joining us, Cristian Ordonez, who is right now in the Global South uh, from his native Chile, and Cyrus Marcus Ware, who's uh, based in Toronto. So I would like to start with Cristian, uh, if you are ready to go ahead and share your, your presentation. I know there was some technical difficulties, that's why we started a bit late, and, and we apologize um, for that, those few minutes that we missed at the beginning. Yes. The floor is yes. Hi, how are you? Let me um, share my presentation. Can you see my screen there? And if I go to full screen, can you see that as well? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Thanks so much for, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to you guys uh, about this project. Um, I always, um, I know we have a, a type uh, timeline for each one of us, so I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I always try to, to give a little bit of an overview of my practice. Uh, so I'm going to share some, some images of different projects that I've done in the, in the past, uh, just to give a little, a little bit of an overview. And then we're going to focus on the, on the project that I'm, that I'm sharing at Sewer Gallery in this group exhibition. Um, so I always start with uh, this quote that says, um, film and sculpture and talk and writing and painting and music and walking and drawing and memory and philosophy and composing and form 
and framing and text and dreaming and mathematics and scene and typography and photography and poetry and scene and. This is a quote, uh, an extract from a, a book called Process, a Tomato Project from 1996. And it's a book that was really influential, influential for me um, when I was studying uh, graphic design back then. Um, my background is graphic design and what, uh, um, what I was uh, guided to this quote was basically because this specific studio from England uh, approached graphic design in the creative industry uh, from different avenues. They actually uh, did a little bit of poetry, they work in video, they work in graphic design with photography, with uh, uh, music, and mixing all these mediums was the way for them to approach either commercial uh, projects, but also uh, personal projects and more artistic, uh, uh, with, with a more artistic approach. And understanding that for me back then, graphic design was more than just a commercial project, was a really uh, interesting way for me to understand that I can also apply, you know, photography and typography uh, in a different way through the graphic design um, spectrum. And that's how I started to approach uh, my practice from a graphic design perspective back then. This was uh, early, early 2000s. I, I actually finished my, my studies in 2000. Um, until now. So uh, I was born in, in Santiago um, in 1976, uh, right in the in the middle of the dictatorship uh, era in, in, in Chile. I also lived in New Zealand, then I went back to Santiago, I lived in Miami, then I went back to Santiago, and I've been here in Toronto since 2008. And I always mention this because I think for me, living outside of Chile, but always coming back, uh, was also really important. Um, I went to New Zealand for the first time in 1988, and it was while um, the dictatorship uh, era was going uh, was going on. Then I came back when the democracy was already in place. So I was still outside of the country when Pinochet left the country, for example. Um, then I was uh, when I was in Toronto, for example. I um, the new era of protests started in, in 2011, uh, and I wasn't there in Chile again. Then what happened in 2019, which is was that's what's re related to uh, what's what I'm showing the gallery, I was also away from the country. And all those little aspects that were really important in our history um, were always I was always look at looking at them from far away in a way. Were, were always really intrinsic in my in my family and how I envision my relationship to Chile and what was going on in my country with friends and family. But I was always looking at that at that from a from a far away perspective. Um, my practice is basically photography, graphic design, and education. And within that, I work on arts photography, which is my own practice. I do photo books, exhibitions, editorial, and collaborations. Uh, graphic design is something similar. Books, editorial, art direction, and collaborations. In education, I work with universities, do workshops, talks, panels, and also do collaboration. And the collaboration part is really important within every, every part of my practice. For me, even though sometimes I do just photography, and this, for example, exhibition is just related to photography, there's always a little bit of graphic design involved in, in that, and there's always a little bit of collaboration. So the, the idea of doing and the DIY aspect of my practice, I think, is really important. Um, process has always been uh, a key aspect of, of my of my practice. Uh, these are details from my wall where I just paste from uh, typographic details to just certain images just to explore. I'll always be looking at things that are inspiring for me or uh, work in progress. And with that, I do also like sketchbooks where I uh, analyze um, images that I've been that I've been shooting in, spe in specific projects. Um, for sometimes these are, you know, just 20 images, 30 images, 100 images that I, I just edit down in things that never end up in different projects, but for me are part of my practice to understand how I'm thinking and how what I'm what I'm looking at. Um, and I also do education where I collaborate with different people. These are images from a, a workshop that I did uh, at Vu uh, Photo, which is in, in Quebec City. Uh, and it's a workshop about editing and photo book where I work with six different artists. So that part of collaboration is also really important because I learn from them and I also help them in, in the process. Um, 
And books, it's uh, it's kind of a, a bridge between both practices, between graphic design and, 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 and photography. This is the first book that I did um, uh, edited by, by a publisher from Chile uh, called A Way to Disconnect and Connect. And it's a book about my first uh, seven uh, years in Canada where I was kind of analyzing um, the, the, the territory and my relationships with different people. Um, my work in general is always related to a little bit of nostalgia, memory, and it's never politic, uh, except for this specific project that also kind of relates to that nostalgic aspect that I was talking about, that I'm, that, that I'm kind of looking at things from far away. Uh, these are some images where my, my children are always uh, somehow involved in this in these projects. And that's also related to how memory reacts to myself because I live as a child from far away and, and to, try to understand how my children were actually reacting to the territory here. I mean, they're in Canada. Um, Think After the Sun, my first book that I uh, did self-publish, which was a relationship to uh, going up north in Ontario. And I'm not going to go deep into any of these projects. Uh, but these projects have started to kind of evolve on their own. Um, uh, I ended up like showing these images in, 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 a, in a fine arts museum in a gallery in Russia. Um, then in 2019, I did another project called Other Voices that is spoke about. Um, I was reading this, this uh, book about from Simon Shama that I speak about the landscape and the memory. And it says here, for example, before it can even be a response from the senses, landscape is the work of the mind. Its scenery is, is built up as much of a strata of memory as from layers of rock. And this idea of how the landscape is related to memory really spoke to me because whenever, for example, I travel from different places that is that in Canada, um, all the way to the Pacific, and I was close to the Pacific, it gave me some sense of memory and some sense of nostalgia from the Pacific in relationship to Chile, but also in relationship to New Zealand. Um, and, and again, that idea of memory, that idea of, of, um, uh, of nostalgia was always involved somehow in the landscape and how I was looking at the territory. So in this case, I, I, I started to play in this book with uh, transparent uh, pages uh, with images of rock and how those were actually communicating and creating a different kind of dialogue with the photography that I was uh, implementing in, in the book. And here are just some, some more images of that specific project uh, that was exhibited in, in, in the Benaki Museum in, in Greece in a, in a photo book exhibition. Um, I also collaborate in, in different kind of editorial projects. This is a book for a client um where they allow me to uh, do abstract photography for a production process of uh, a design uh, a furniture design company from Italy and then it ended up being in a book in in a video and another project where uh, I work with a good friend of mine called Justin Pape who is the one that work with me on the on the uh, pieces that are ex um, exhibited in at Sur Gallery, creating all the woodwork. Um, and he, for example, in this particular case, um, created these little sculptures that are uh, hosting cassette tapes um, um, with uh, materials that are heritage from different buildings. Uh, sorry, there are bricks that are being taken from heritage buildings that are being demolished within Ontario. Uh, so we're using recycled material to create a um, little sculpture uh, that contain tapes. And I'm create, I created a series of images um, printed in silver gelatin prints in my darkroom uh, to identify each one of them. So there are specific uh, individual pieces. Uh, notes, uh, another series of books uh, that I spoke uh, about a trip that, I, that I've been doing through, through the United States. And these are a series of books um, that are basically annotations that are, and that are also related to a, a project called On Trial um, that, I, that was published um, last, sorry, this year by ACB Press, which is a in the, in the independent publisher from Australia.
And now we're in my last project, which is Frequency, which is a, a project that I've been working on from uh, since 2020, when the pandemic started. It's not necessarily about the pandemic, but it's related to the uh, area of the pandemic uh, to that to the specific uh, time, and it speaks basically about our relationship to the environment and to the landscape and to the landscape and about the anxiety uh, that all the uh, pandemic time uh, created in ourselves. Uh, the project won the Bortinsky grant, and I'm hoping to publish a book next year. And I'm currently in Chile, um, where I'm basically exhibiting. Uh, um, this project in a in a solo exhibition in, in Galeria Animal, which is a gallery here in Santiago. Um, I don't have a specific, I don't have the final photograph yet because the, the exhibition just opened last week. Um, but that's where I'm what I'm currently in Chile. And trauma, which is uh, the book, the the project that I'm that I'm that I'm basically exhibiting in uh, part of the project that I'm basically exhibiting in in Sur Gallery. Um, so going back to October 18th of, of 2019 is when uh, the social explosion started in Santiago. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of, of this or not, but during uh, Chile has a current constitution that was built, uh, that was written within the, by Pinochet and, and, and his associates um, and was written in 1918, sorry, 1980. Uh, so it's been, and since then, uh, has been uh, the constitution that has written all the laws um, in the country. Um, the constitution, Chile is basically the, the birthplace of neo the neoliberalism system. Um, and it was good in terms of economy. However, it created a huge uh, difference in terms of income in the country. And some of those reasons escalated within many years in what happened in, in October 18 of 2019, where there was a social explosion in the country, uh, a random uh, thing that happened from one day to another. Uh, but thinking back of the reasons, it was something that just basically was escalating for, for different reasons throughout the years. Um, inequality of income, um, inequality of education system, uh, expensive uh, health systems, uh, privati privatization of water, um, in between many other things that were part of the Chil of the Chilean people, and now where everything was private, and between the different kind of income of the people, everything was getting really really expensive. Um, I was in in Toronto when this happened. And basically, most of my information, the information that I, that I got, was basically through through media, um, basically through 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 the internet, um, through friends. My parents started to send me newspapers, um, and what was happening in the country was really affecting me, my family, and everyone around me. Um, here in, Tor in Toronto, we were uh, actually also going uh, to protest to the. Uh, to the uh, to the Chilean embassy, uh, but also to the city council with uh, with other Chileans, just to show some kind of support um, uh, to the Chilean people um, uh, of, because of what was happening. Uh, you can see in these images militars. You can see people with um, um, their eyes uh, hidden because militars and police were actually throwing, uh, mostly police were actually throwing uh, rubber bullets to the people protesting, and a lot of people actually lost their sight. Um, and there's signs like this, for example, like that, what you see in the, in the center that says, we are worse, but uh, we are better, because before we were fine, but it was a lie. Uh, now we are bad, but it's the truth. So when they say about the social explosion, it's basically say there's a there's a sentence that it says uh, Chile has awoken, um, and it seems that Chile Chile or the Chilean people were asleep for the last forty years, and they realized what was going on in their system and how everyone was basically you know getting into loans and 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 not having enough money and being able to have you know two cars, multiple computers, being able to go. To have, have a, a universal university edu edu education and, and going on vacations outside of the country. But everything was based on loans. And I'm, I'm talking here 
most of the country, like the poor people and the middle class. And in the middle class, there's different kind of layers. Uh, there's not like one middle class uh, in the country. Um, but everyone was going through the same system. And when the when the country basically awoken, all the social explosion happened uh, that was written based on the news on the new constitution. Uh, militars came back into the country, and of course, because of the dictatorship, seeing militars against in the country was a huge impact for everyone. Um, going back to in time, this is an image from the coup of 1973. Uh, so these images were what all, most of our parents had in mind when they saw militars in the, in the, in the, in, in the streets. However, the younger people, the younger generation, uh, which are the ones that started um, protesting in 2011 against the educational system, uh, were the ones that were uh, in the streets protesting. And they were not afraid because they didn't live through, um, in, in 1973, they were not afraid of the militars. And you can see some certain images where they're even, they were even uh, fighting against them. Um, so there was a tension and an anxiety, a consistent anxiety and tension uh, in the city everywhere. Um, I started to uh, investigate to going back in, going back to, to history and seeing documentaries, but also on this, trying to understand why, um, why what was this happening? And it's not that I didn't know about this. However, uh, with all this all this information, um, sometimes you and, and because you 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 get used to living the system, um, you kind of forget of the things that, that 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 were happening. And obviously, the poverty and the rich people in the country there was a huge huge difference. Um, I think I, I read this uh, at at some point, but the poor there's certain the lower part of the poor people in the in, in Chile live like some some countries in Africa. Uh, like poor countries in Africa, and the rich people in 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 Chile, which is like one or two percent, live like people in Luxembourg. So the difference, and that this is within one city. So the difference is huge. And there's this um, uh, headline that I have written the, down down here from nineteen sorry from two thousand and sixteen, from Libre Mercado, which is a website a newspaper from Spain that says, "The miracle of Chile, uh, the, the the country that went from poor to the rich." To a rich country in 30 years. And that was how uh, the country was being visualized from the outside. And that, that was because economy was stable, but still there was a lot of kind of uh, poor people in the country. And this is the basically the neoliberalism system, the house, how it's uh how it was affecting the, the economy, the economic system. Again, I was informing myself through social media, through videos. Um, saving videos and, and, and watching them again of everything that was happening in the country. And from far away, having that anxiety was really affecting me. I had before, before the social explosion started, uh, I already had a, a trip from November 18, sorry, November 11. Um, so before a month after this social explosion started, I was able to go back to Chile. And within that time, when I was waiting to travel, um, millions of people went to the into the streets in Chile to basically protest and manifest themselves against what was happening because the, the president said basically uh, send the militaries into the streets and said that the they were against they were in war against their 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 own people. Um, again, millions of people went into the streets to protest. Um, so there was a sense of being of being Chilean, sense of belonging that was really really strong everywhere. Um, and of course, being far away uh, was even harder because you wanted to be part of it. And even more for me, because all, all these uh, important aspects of our, of our history, I was, I was far away. And knowing that I was going to be there in just a few more days, uh, the anxiety was building up even more. When I arrived in Chile, uh, I started photographing. I took many cameras, uh, like not many, I took three cameras, a point and shoot and, a lot, and two medium format cameras. But I started photographing like every, everywhere. For the first time in Chile that since I've been back that I didn't even leave Santiago. We were there for almost a month with my family and we stayed in Santiago all the time. I was visiting um, what, we, what we call Ground Zero where most of the protests were, were happening. And the protests, even though there was always an aspect of uh, violence, uh, the core part of the protests felt like a festival. 
people were happy, people were dancing, there was a lot of art involved, people were manifesting themselves, people from different backgrounds, different social media, social, not social media, social backgrounds who were actually getting together to protest against the same, um, the same um, ideas, the same aspect of what was happening in the country. So the sense of belonging even increased even, uh, even more. Um, when I see the photographs now, I realized that there was there were I was photographing pretty much everything. And I guess it was that that anxiety that was building up into and how I was reacting to what was to what I was seeing. So I photographed, you know, from protests, being involved in that in that in that environment to also uh, architecture and how the city was being affected. Um, build architectural buildings, details, um, um, sculptures, or how even churches were being affected to. Uh, by the people manifesting themselves, uh, or even corners where I was seeing certain kind of repetition elements where people actually were uh, expressing themselves for different messages against the government, against you know uh, what the system was was provide providing to the country. Um, financial systems um, like um, financial institutions, banks were actually blocking with metals um, uh, their facades, basically to protect themselves from protesters because people were so angry that in some cases were breaking windows um, or even you know going into um, private uh, and, and public institutions to steal things in some, in some cases, uh, which I'm not a favor of, but those were the things that were happening. And I also started to photograph protesters um, in this main, mostly in this main core uh, area. Uh, people manifesting with different kind of pancartas, uh, writing messages in their in, the, in their in their body. For example, this girl says, uh, "My body, my territory um, is basically for me to 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 enjoy and to in in a, in a territory of resistance." Um, uh, education and emotion, uh, educational. Sorry, edu I, I'm trying to read this one. Education, emotions, and sexual, um, like sexual education and emotional. Right now, uh, things that were not happening, not even in the, in, in in the educational system. Between other things, um, and some other photographs were you know people that were in favor of what was happening, but, but because they don't have money, they are in the protest. But as a family, they are actually you know, have to make a living. So they're still like selling things to provide for their family. So even, even if they're part of this, they were not even able to, you know, manifest, manifest themselves, protest with the rest of the, of the people because they, they had this need to provide and, and give, you know, food to their own families. Um, you know, people, young people running against uh, tear gas or subway stations that were burned um, which is was one of the main uh, things that started all this social explosion. Then at some point I realized that uh, most of the photographs, I was kind of repeating the photograph that many people were actually taking. Um, and, I, and, 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 I, and I kind of understood that that wasn't my vision. Uh, I was kind of repeating and reacting to the things that were in front of me. And, but at the same time, it wasn't the things, my own um, photographic language. Um, and the anxiety wasn't going away. I was there, I was being, being part of it, but everything was still happening. I left the country and things were still going on, obviously for certain more months until the pandemic started. And then it even continued until now. And these photographs started to, to provide a little bit more of a language for me, uh, something that was a little bit more subtle, but also uh, it gave you a little bit more of a sense of interpretation and it provided a little bit more anxiety uh, and um, a sense of not really understanding what was going on, which is what you actually, what I actually um, sense being far away. But when, when, when you were involved in one of these protests in the center, um, sometimes violence happened because police came around and everyone started to run away. And that sense of anxiety was basically um, how everything uh, felt, how everything in the country felt. So these images started to, to, to speak to me a little bit more. Um, images that were not easy to read and, be, and that were a little bit more ambiguous. 
um, or images that you know um, I started to shoot, not even not even looking through the lens, um, which is how you felt when you were involved around all these people, like a block from from you. You could hear uh, the sirens, you can hear violence, but you were surrounded by people, you know, sometimes dancing, but like, not even a, a block away you can sense you know the smell of the tear gas and and something completely different was happening so you could you had to be aware of everything that was happening um one of the newspapers uh published the current constitution even though the constitution is public not everyone actually um have had re read the, the public the, the constitution and this happened when the when the democracy uh, uh arrived in the country um the dictatorship left, the democracy arrived, and things like cultural from, you know, from NTV to having access to multiple things and, and internet. So there was kind of a flourish in the country and everyone kind of forgot about the constitution and everyone just started to live their whole life, study and be happy. Um, but again, our families were getting into loans and getting into this kind of this, um, this uh, snowball that was just getting bigger, bigger, and bigger. And I started to experiment with the constitution and images and seeing how those two languages could actually react to themselves. Uh, then I started to scan some of the images that was shooting in color, um, scan them, printing them in, a, in an all uh, laser print, then scan them again, then print them again, and trying to understand how all this print collateral print matter was being was basically a translation of how the media was giving me all the information all the media was being filtered oh sorry all the information that I was driving to me was being filtered through the media and I was in a way kind of trying to replicate that that process in with my own photographs then I realized that this texture that was coming from the newspapers, and I started to to get to get more involved into that. Uh, long story short, most of my photographs that I'm being exhibited are part of that process, uh, a part of a process that uh, experimentation from almost uh, 400 um, rolls of film that I that I shot during that process, um, having this process of experimentation with printed matter. Understanding how media was going was was being uh, was basically arriving to me and how the media was uh, informing the way that I was looking into my own work. Um, these are the images that uh, within the texture uh, through the process are are shown in the gallery. And you have uh, basically uh, um, a selection of the different kind of details that I was that I was shooting. Some of them are details of the images where I was focusing in certain certain parts, and this is also because of what was what I was saying before. When you were in the center of a protest, um, sometimes there were like a thousand people, five hundred people, so you couldn't see what was happening in other places um, that were even sometimes even more important what you that, than what you see. You know, like um ar around you basically um so trying to zoom in and to to react to the, all those details was really important and that sense of mystery like for example this image on the right uh sorry the image on the left as uh, somebody holding their hand as a sense of like power like power to the people in a way and on the right um uh, this mystery uh you know, uh, almost mysterious and hard to take uh, image of police officers going across the street to a protest. Um, I took this picture um, while I was having lunch. So there was in, in a terrace in a restaurant. So what there was this sense of normality while while there was actually a protest happening in certain in certain areas that was really really hard to take. Um, but either way, I have family that were policemen. Um, and I have friends that have a relationship to policemen, but I also have family that were, you know, um, a torture within the in, in the dictatorship in 1973. So, and I'm not the only one. Many people that I know have this also also this this duality of information coming from different parts, from family, but also from what's happening in the country. So, for me, this image is really important because it speaks about that uh, that tension um, of what was happening in the country. And it's also hard to take, hard, hard to read, which in some cases 
uh, I, I invite the, the viewer to get close and to, or, or to move far away to try to read the image. And I finish with this image of this couple um, uh, looking at fire in the barricade, which kind of um, speaks even more about what was happening in, in every, every day in the country. Um, the structure of the, of the installation was built with uh, simple wood. Uh, and with magnets and with paper printed in uh, with laser, uh, all black and white. And the, the decision to use these minimal uh, materials um, and even wood was how could how could I relate these uh, these images to what you see you, you saw in the streets uh, in Chile, um, people with their pancartas or people like putting wood. Uh, on their windows and and people and, and the rest of the people basically putting posters uh, as a protest on the streets. Um, it didn't make sense to me to print these images in fine art uh, paper or or archival material because first of all those are expensive materials that spoke against what the people were um, protesting. Um, so making something simpler that spoke to the um, to the primate ideas of what these protests were about uh, made sense to me in terms of materials. And this is the uh, the installation. Um, a is 12 panels, two rows of six um, of uh, these images that uh, gives uh, a little bit of an overview of what I saw um, in the country. That's it, thank you. Great, thank you, Christian. Um, that was wonderful. And we will have some time at the end um, afterwards for some questions from the audience. Okay. So without uh, further ado, we also have invited uh, another artist that is participating in the exhibition, The People United. Um, and it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, Cyrus Marcus Ware. The floor is yours, Cyrus. You're on mute, Cyrus. On mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. So thank you so much for having me here today and for the chance to join you. And Christiana, it was so beautiful to get to experience your work and um, it's an honor to be in this show together. Um, I'm an artist and an activist. So I'll just start by saying I'm, uh, you know, right now on Toronto Island, on area that was under water partially and or not included in the Toronto Purchase. And this is the unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and I'm just really thinking a lot about what it means to protest in these territories, what it means to think about the people united uh, in these territories and what it might mean to show up in a really solid and committed way for land back and for Indigenous resurgence and just thinking about that in my practice. Um, so yeah, I'm an artist and an activist and a scholar and I've been making work for about 25 years, which is about the same amount of time that I've been an activist and I've been organizing around Black justice and liberation, uh, disability justice and trans justice for, for 25 years. Um, I'm really, uh, I feel really lucky to get to be an artist and an activist, to get to make uh, work about uh, the issues that are really relevant to my community. There's this beautiful uh, Asada Shakur and Asian Dub Foundation track from the early 2000s or late 90s, if you'll remember it, that's called Committed to Life. And um, in this track, which is sort of like a dub track, uh, or like kind of like a uh, well, drum and bass maybe track, uh, in this in this track, Asada Shakur says the lines that she is a struggler, but she was born into this world as a struggler, and that she wished that she was not a struggler because she says she would be free to be so much more. She wanted to be a sculptor or a gardener 
but that in this life she was a struggler and that she was a struggler because the only way to live with any human dignity at this planet, on this planet at the moment, she says, is to struggle. And so I've been thinking about how lucky I feel that I get to be a struggler and a gardener and a sculptor and get to make work about political uh, content. Uh, so really, really thankful. I've been really moved by this quote from Tony Cade Bambera, uh, who said in the, I think this is from 1982, she said uh, that the role of the artist from the oppressed or marginalized community was to, in fact, make the revolution irresistible. So she says, as a cultural worker who belongs to an oppressed people, my job is to make the revolution irresistible. And I've been really, really captivated by this phrase from this Black feminist thinker and what it might mean to create and seed forward irresistible revolutions through engagement and through collaboration and through all of the ways that we get to do our creative practice. She, of course, says, you know, this is an act of resistance is for, for many of us, particularly, I think, for people who are at multiple intersections of difference, the act of getting up the act of breathing is cause for celebration. So she's, you know, not asking for us to do more than we uh, can physically do, but she's saying, you know, we get to exist as irresistible revolutions um, ourselves. So really uh, drawn to this quote, and it's really inspired a lot of my practice. I've been doing a, an activist portrait series for several years now for for about eight years and I it, it grew out of um, so these are these massive portraits, two of which are in the exhibition the people united. Um, and it grew out of this work that I was doing in my community where I was uh, doing this activist love letter project where I was inviting people to come together and I would read aloud from letters that activists had written to each other like James Baldwin writing to Angela Davis when she was in prison. Leonard Peltier writing to Mumia Abu Jamal, Les Feinberg writing in support of C.C. McDonald, these letters, these love letters that these activists had written to each other. So I invite people to come and listen to these letters, and then I invite them to write a letter to, a, to someone in their community who's doing something that they feel uh, is really making a difference, is really helping to change the world. And if people aren't connected to activists in their communities, I had strung up these, you know, sort of clothesline you know, strings with uh, with bios attached to them and on these close pipes with bios of activists and organizers in their communities. So no matter what community I was doing the performance in, I've done it out in Muskegon, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territories, out in Vancouver. You know, I've done it in many places all over Ontario. You know, I've done it in the States. Wherever I go, I would research the activists and organizers in those communities and do little bios for them and then invite people to write these letters. So anyways, it's been, um, I've been doing that project since 2012. And now I've mailed, um, I guess at this point, it's almost thousands of letters um, around the world. And people write back. They write back because I include a return address. And it, we just are in these engagements and conversations with activists now all over the world. And it's been amazing. And I realized that I loved writing the letters, but I wanted to get to know them better. And so I started drawing these activists. I started drawing some of the activists who were in Northern Turtle Island or in Takarondo, uh, in the areas that I was in, um, as a way of getting to know them better, as a continuation of this love letter project, as a way of exploring Black joy, Black uh, grief, um, uh, Black life, uh, Black love, uh, as a way of telling disabled, deaf and mad stories, as a way of drawing trans people into existence, I started drawing these massive, massive portraits. This is a portrait of Kona Kachanya, who is a non-binary um, disabled uh, artist and activist who is based in Musqueam, Swamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territories, and is one half of the group that puts together Black Chat, which is this Black uh, activist and art space that uh, has both monthly or you know six week uh, meetups and also a, a podcast as well from the same name. So this was um, a drawing I had done for an exhibition at, at Grunt Gallery in Vancouver, and I you know I got to draw Kona and and Kona has this laugh and this joy that just radiates from them. 
um, when they tell stories and when they're, you know, just sort of being themselves. And so this was this opportunity to draw Kona in a classic sort of image, leaning forward, just full of laughter. And so these portraits have been opportunities to capture these moments and capture these 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 brief moments where we get to be maybe a little bit something approximating free. So uh, in order to draw these portraits, I've been asking the people that I've been drawing the same three questions for eight years. And these are the questions that I asked them. First, I asked them how they got involved in organizing and activism, which is actually kind of a more on the boring side of the question, because, you know, I mean, you say what you say, but people's faces do particular things. And I would take photographs of them while they answer. The second question I would ask them is if they could just, if they could describe for me, if they could go like at any point in human history, any point in time, any place on the planet and get involved in a social movement, where would they go and when would they go and why? So that's a question for you as well. If you could go to any point in human history, to any social movement on this planet, what would you want to go join in on and what would you want to be present for and why? And their faces do these amazing things and they're like, oh my gosh. Some people talk about wanting to go to the March on Washington and be present for that. Some people want to go way back 4,000 years. And there are other people who I photographed who you know are like, I want to go to 3,000. I want to go to 3,100. I want to see how it turns out. So really interesting things that their faces do. And then the last question that I asked them, and this is what Queen Titi Opelecki in this portrait here is responding to, is this question where I asked them if they can describe for me in words, the feeling that they get when they first realize that they're falling in love. And then their faces do this particular thing. And I mean, everyone's face is different, but people kind of have a, an emotional reaction to that question. And Queen Titi had uh, her hands up in the air and was just in this moment of almost like rapture describing uh, this beginning of love uh, and joy. So it's just been such an honor to get to work on this project and to get to create this activist portrait series that interrupts this, um, power hierarchy that portraiture is implicated in. Portraiture literally uh, decides in a lot of ways who we consider to be inherently valuable. And when you think about who gets their portrait drawn and why, it's often very particular people, people who are wealthy, people who are white, people who are often in positions of power, popes, kings, um, maybe university presidents, but you know, like this is who gets their portrait painted and large and in an illegal way. And I wanted to interrupt that. I wanted to put the frame, if you will, around people who I thought were really deserving of this attention. And that was these activists, these activists who were laying their lives on the line to make uh, organizing happen in their community. Kunti Tiopalecki started Prosthetics for Foreign Donation, which is this incredible resource that gathers and collects prosthetics from all over Northern Turtle Island where you cannot recycle or reuse prosthetics um, and ships them to places in the world where people are desperate for prosthetics. And so now I think at the last count, when I had talked to them, uh, they had shipped out almost 70,000 prosthetics all over the world. Uh, and, and this was part of their organizing around disability justice. They and their son are both amputees. And so just really beautiful work. Um, I started playing with uh, the portraits and so those two portraits, Queen Titi Opelecki and the portrait of Kona Katrenya, are in the People United exhibition. So you can go and see it in real life. They're about, you know, 10 feet tall. I think the one of Kona's is maybe even a little bit longer. Um, and that there are these massive portraits, five foot wide. The one of Queen Titi Opelecki is six foot wide. But I started playing with them and turning them into a wallpaper series. So I'm calling this the activist wallpaper series. You can see the theme here. But I've been creating these wallpapers that get literally put up in, you know, as wall works in galleries and um, my, uh, you know, my dream, of course, is for it to be in someone's hallway or something so that what they see when they're getting ready for work or getting ready to start their day are these beautiful portraits of Black Joy and these portraits of, of activists. But this is Kona reimagined as a wall, wallpaper uh, work uh, repeated over and over again. I was so interested by that toile wallpaper with the uh, sort of images that get repeated over and over again, usually of bucolic countryside scenes of people that you don't know, uh, rich white people really, uh, sort of relaxing in the country. 
uh, side. And I thought, you know, that's sort of a strange thing to have in your bathroom. So what would it look like if we had other images in our home spaces that also creates a literal uh, physical change to the environment where again we get to exist in these moments of a bit of freeness. This is a wallpaper that I made of Queen Titi Opalecki that's up at Campbell River Art Gallery in North Vancouver Island um, and played with uh, this sort of color pattern and again this is just a sort of repetition and the patterns that are created from it uh, through repeating the, the works over and over again. This is a wall work that's currently on display at Harbour Front Centre, and it's a wall work, a wallpaper of Echinacea, purple cone flower, which is this medicine, medicinal flower that is used to support so many uh, things within dis disabled uh, deaf and mad communities, and it's a portrait of Courage Bacchus, who's a deaf woman, a deaf actor, and performer, and um, uh, she was in 21 Black Futures by CBC and Obsidian, and is like a, I, I, I don't know how many medals she's won in the Olympics, but uh, when you see the portrait of her with her medals on her arms, she's won many, many, many medals. She's a track uh, and field star. And so I wanted to draw this portrait. This was for a disability festival called Commotion. And I really wanted uh, to make sure that there was deaf presence in the festival, because often when we hear about disabled deaf mad uh, festivals or communities, we sometimes uh, don't have that linguistic uh, inclusion of ASL speakers and of deaf, uh, deaf and hard of hearing uh, community members. So I wanted to, to focus my wallpaper on uh, this amazing um, deaf Olympian and actor and performer uh, and friend, uh, Courage Bacchus. So uh, this was Courage um, uh, standing on a, a track actually, and then it's uh, paired with this drawing that I made of echinacea of uh, purple cone flower. So it just kind of gives you a bit of a sense of what some of these wall works are like. This is a wall work that was put up at Leonard Baird Gallery in Montreal and features actually three portraits, a portrait of Kim and Crew, who's a black trans artist and activist based in uh, Jojage and uh, Montreal. Uh, there's a portrait of Omi Shere Dryden, who was based here and is now in Chibuktuk in Halifax, and a portrait of Rodney de Verlis, who is uh, based here in Tagorondo. So this is Rodney uh, and Omi Shere, and uh, this is how it got repeated. Uh, you can see Rodney as the middle band there, dancing up and down, and Omi Shere, and then the circles have uh, the portrait of Kim and Crow. So it's been really amazing to take these portraits, which are these analog objects, you know, to draw one of those portraits, it, you know, it's about 80 hours to draw a portrait. I'll often do it in one sitting. I'll often do it as a durational performance. I'll often draw in a gallery and just have the gallery open and, and have people come and watch me draw. It's really a fun process for me, but then to take that work and to turn it into digital content that then I can manipulate and change and create these other works like the activist wallpaper series. It's been really incredible and I feel really thankful uh, for the chance to get to do that. So um, there's Kona, there's Queen Titi Opalaki. And if you want to see the wall works aren't in the exhibition, but their portraits are in the exhibition. So you can go and spend time with them. Um, one of the greatest things that I think has come out of this project for me is that somebody, many people have come up to me after seeing the works and said, who is this person? I really want to get to know them better. I really want to learn more about them. And I think having more care and more attention and more love going towards activists in our communities is ultimately going to ensure that these activists can stay in the struggle for the long haul, that these activists can be supported in doing the work that they need to do, and that they can thrive and not just survive, sort of just as Asada Shakur was saying, like just being in the struggle. Um, so really uh, thankful for that. The other work that I have uh, in the exhibition is this video work that was commissioned for the Toronto Biennial, um, and it's uh, called Ancestors Do You Read Us? Dispatches from the Future, and it's set in the year 2072. It's part of an entire world that I created that takes place between 2027 and 2072. Um, 
ancestors to Uridas is the work that's in uh, Sur Gallery, and it's set in the year 2072. And there's two other uh, sister projects that I'll tell you about, Antarctica and Mary Birdland Freedom, that are set uh, a little bit closer to the year 2030. Um, in this video, it, this video presupposes that we survive, that we survive that we survive the Black Death spe spectacle that we see on the news every day, that we survive climate change, that we survive the, you know, the, the wickedness and, and, and violence of capitalism and race-based capitalism, that we survive, that we make it to 2072. And, it, and the, the video picks up when our great-great-grandchildren have figured out a way using old technology to patch through into the past to give us a message an important, a dispatch from the future, a message that tells us what we need to do in order for them to have the freedom that they're currently enjoying. And so it's a bit of a chicken and an egg. Would the freedom have happened if they hadn't sent the message? Would they have not known to send the message if they, anyways? So this is a beautiful uh, story. I got to work with some incredible performers. This is Raven Wings and Gloria Swain, uh, two Black artists uh, based in Tagorondo who play uh, some of our great grandchildren. Uh, this is uh, an installation shot of the video. So it's actually a eight channel video work shot in 4K um, that uh, you know does bring uh, all of the video together and, and breaks apart into different sections. Um, this is uh, Jazz Fairy J, uh, Janine Carrington, Keisha Williams and Rodney Deverlis, um, who also play some of our great, great grandchildren. Um, and I wanted to just play a little bit of the video for you. This is uh, Ancestors Do You Read Us. So our great, great grandchildren use this old technology. They patch through, but they keep glitching in and out of time zones as they try to find us in the year 2019. And this is what happens. Do you read me? Do you read me? Can you read us? Can you copy? Can you read us? Can you copy? Do you read us? Well, can you read me? We are your great grandchildren. And we have a message for you. Culture. This scene is really gone crazy out here right now. Do you read us? Do you read us? Can you copy? We have a message for you from 2072. We are your great grandchildren. We are your great grandchildren. We have a message for you. The first thing we want. The first to thing say, we want to say is that we love you. Is that we love you. It was because of you that we survived three generations past what was predicted. It was because of you that we were able to stop this ravage of the earth, our mother. We were able to stop this ravage of the earth. The atomic age has moved forward at such a pace. The language of atomic warfare. The atomic age has moved the forward age at such a pace. Moved forward at such the, a language, the language of atomic warfare. Do you read us? Can you copy? Do you read me? Can you copy? The second thing is, we want to warn you. We want to warn you. You told us how to build this technology to contact you, to act, to rebel, to take this earth back from the capitalists. You told us how to create this technology to contact you. So we can tell you to act. To rebel. So that's just a little taste of Ancestors Do You Read Us? But basically they do end up giving us some messages and so we have some work to do. We have some work to do in order for them to get to live in the free. We note in that video, there are indigenous people, there are Afro-indigenous people, there are black people. We know that based on what we learned from the Combahee River Collective, this black um, feminist radical uh, thought collective uh, operating in the 70s and 80s, they said, if we make the world safer for those who are most marginalized, 
we are necessarily making the world safer for everyone. And so if we've made the world safer for uh, Black and Indigenous people enough that they've survived, we know that everybody has survived. And so it's this opportunity to imagine a different kind of future. So it very much ties to this idea of these irresistible revolutions, this idea of creating work that sparks and ins or inspires people to want to uh, push forward and to make uh, change happen. Of course, I'm an activist. I mentioned at the beginning, I've been an activist for 25 years. Uh, when I made that work in 2019, Ancestors Do You Read Us, you know, I was still, uh, you know, whenever I would talk about abolition, it was really hard to get the conversation going. And then when the pandemic hit and then the uprisings hit of 2020, we suddenly saw abolition being discussed everywhere. You know, so many people were talking about either defund the police and reinvesting in the community, this idea that comes out of disability justice communities, this idea that we take care of each other and mutual aid, and then this idea that we could uh, actually build an abolitionist community that uh, was free, which I think as we get a glimpse of in Ancestors Do You Read Us, this idea of a free future that looks different. On Juneteenth at eight in the morning, on Juneteenth in 2020, which is this day to commemorate the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, or more specifically of Texas finally adopting the signing uh, or accepting the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, not that that particularly ended slavery, but uh, on this day of Juneteenth, which also commemorates several key moments in Black liberatory history, we gathered 80 artists together in front of police headquarters to send a message about abolition, to send a message about defunding the police, to send a message about what we wanted to do to reinvest in our communities. Um, and so this is me uh, painting the street. Uh, we made a 7,200 square foot mural um on right in front of police headquarters and uh this is what we this is what we did It's hard to listen, but listen Cause it's much harder living it than listening To the hardships, so the heart's conditioned It conditioned the air, when the air that conditions Keep cool, but the more tears Sometimes it clear the vision, not what I see Been a long time coming to drop Running, rocking, reaching new peaks So them youngest can finally summit Climbing high above and then flying from it Up to the skies and overstanding the corruption And deconstructing the lies I've seen this country decline Try to keep discussions confined Hide the underside, over extract And try to undermine Damn, but I still believe in the truth Whether it's an MC in the booth or a PhD in the suit Yo, when we yell and protest Tell them the feeling is peaceful We profess, we pro Testify to the will of the people Tell them what they must know Turn it up loud when we bust flows Not in hushed tones Speaking up, let the trust grow Now you don't gotta tell me how you feel Cause I can see it in your eyes You don't gotta tell me that the pain is real so that was uh, the mural that we ended up making. This is what it ended up looking like. Um, and we worked with uh, Canadian artists. We worked with uh, some well-known uh, artists in part because of the safety that that provided of having um, you know, people who would have been a bigger deal if they had been arrested. We were really worried about arrests. Uh, on this day because of where it was and because of you know how big it was and how long it we actually painted it pretty quickly but uh, uh, this was this beautiful message that then kind of inspired me to really feed this back so that when it came time to uh, you know produce the work that I produced for the 2022 biennial I was able to really thread abolition in an, in an even more overt way uh, into the work uh, and, it, and it allowed me to kind of bring that forward so in 2019 I had created this story called Antarctica and it was this play and multimedia installation and it was based on a real life fact which is that 11 people have been sent to Antarctica to be born to stake a future land claim after Antarctica was set aside as a scientific preserve in the 1950s. It was divided up into these pie-shaped future colonies, but they agreed, no one's gonna live here, we're just gonna use it for scientific research. But then these people were sent there to be born. So my uh, story picks up at that point where because of race wars, 
because of rampant white supremacy, because of climate change, Antarctica becomes one of the last physical places, and these 11 people are sent home to colonize and stake these future land claims. So I worked with uh, Dainty Smith, Yusuf Kadura, and uh, Raven Wings uh, to be able to tell the story. It incorporated drawing, it incorporated these textile installations. Everything in the installation was white to reference white supremacy, to reference the ice, the snow. And it tells the story about this sort of uh, loose polyamorous throuple uh, of these BIPOC Antarcticans who uh, for, for various reasons have agreed to come on this mission and all uh, have very different decisions about what they should do when they get there. Sabian played by Raven Wings uh, really encourages the rest of them to break free and to go to set up uh, a new community, an abolitionist community in the free territory, the one part of Antarctica that hasn't been claimed by uh, by anyone, which is this area called Mary Bird Land. So she encourages them to leave this whiteness behind and to go. And by the end of the play, and by the end of the 2019 biennial, they had gotten into the waters, icy waters, to swim uh, with their thermal regulators on, to swim to this uh, free territory to set up. And that's what I picked up with for the 2022 biennial, was this beautiful story about abolition, about justice, about what it would mean would humans ever realize that colonization is never okay, no matter what their you know justification. Uh, and it told the story about an abolitionist society that starts to be built from the early seeds. Uh, we filmed on the island here in Tabarondo, and of course in the storyline when they arrive at Mary Birdland Freedom, oh boy, it turns out somebody is already there uh, who has a very different idea of what they want to do with the territory. Uh, to their surprise, there's already been terraforming that started, so there's plants and moss and sphagnum and lichen, um, and uh, we get to tell this story about these three. So this is the actors uh, reprising their roles, Dainty Smith, Raven Wings, and Yusuf Kadora. And as I mentioned, this is part two. So this is what happens just before we get to the free uh, space that they're living in, in Ancestors Do You Read Us. So this is set in the year 2030. We worked with this beautiful uh, textile artist, Jenna Reed, uh, and made these beautiful textiles for these geodesic domes that uh, are the what they discover when they land here in Antarctica. Um, the video is a three channel video work and it features a little bit of animation at the beginning and then it goes into this story of them first landing on the shore, discovering these domes, discovering this enigmatic stranger, and then having to decide together what they're going to do. I'll play just uh, 30 seconds of this for you. Do you know how it started? How we got here? I know, I know, the orientation video. But have you ever heard the real story? The story of the time before we got here, when it was just the three of them, swimming, trying to find free land. So I got to work with these actors. We got to tell this beautiful story. You can hear the audio, the, the sound that you just heard, the vocalization was Rosina Kazi, longtime activist and artist, part of the duo Lao, part of the 
what the team that puts together Unit 2 at really great to work with so many activists in the making of this work. Um, and the animation was uh, done by Cindy Mochizuki, uh, who's based out in West Graham, Squamish, and tsleil territory, who I had a dream <laughs> that we were supposed to work together on a project, and then it turns out that this was the project that was supposed to happen. So um, uh, as I say, all of my work is these ideas of potentially sparking some irresistible revolutions. So it's been such an honor to get to be in an exhibition called The People United, to get to be in an exhibition full of artists who are thinking critical thoughts about the changes that we want to make in the world. So thank you again uh, so much to all of you for the chance to um, be part of this exhibition. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, it's, it's just been so great. So thank you. Thank you, Cyrus. That was wonderful. Um... Wow, breathtaking. Yes, applause. <laughs> um, there's so much richness, so much there in both of your practices, uh, very different approaches um, and different mediums. Um, I'm leaving it open to the public. If there is any questions, there were some people who um, left, but uh, there are still a couple of you here with us. And again, we will be sharing this uh, recording on our social platforms and our website. Um, we always get a lot of um, uh, audience uh, viewing these videos. So I thank you both for agreeing to record it. Any questions? I know it takes some time to digest all of the information that was shared, all of the work. Um, it's certainly, it's certainly uh, breathtaking work. Uh, Cyrus, I'm always so impressed with um, the level of um, commitment that you have uh, towards not only your practice, but your activism and how you blend these two worlds together. Um, and how you also bring uh, those same people into the, this practice, the people that are very close to you in activism. Um, is it always the case or is it sometimes that you work with uh, people who you might not necessarily know Yeah, definitely. I, I love getting ch a chance to work with um, my community because, you know, it's like when you get to come to work um, and be in community and be in relation with people and make, I mean, Adrienne Marie Brown talks about speculative fiction as practicing the future. So I'm making speculative fiction work and I get to practice the future with people that I want to spend the future with. Uh, so I do get to work with people. I've worked with Raven quite a bit. Um, I work with Dainty quite a bit. I work with Rodney quite a bit, but I've also worked with people that I don't know, and that's exciting. Like this summer, I did a new play that's called "Does That Make Me Crazy," which is all about a mixed race uh, family and a mad uh, a main character and his experience with policing and his experience with psychiatrization. Uh, really beautiful, but it was a huge cast. Uh, I don't do anything small scale, it seems. So there was like <laughs> eight or nine people, which is large for a theater work. Uh, and so I necessarily was working with people that I didn't know, uh, and I got to meet people through the process. So I met this actor, Isaac Cunningham, who I had never worked with before, and now I want to work with again uh, as soon as possible. And we just had such a great experience uh, getting to be in this play together and getting to, to sort of work. So I found people in that process through uh, sort of shaking the bushes and asking people who are the great great people that you love working with because uh, to me so much of it is about fit it's about connection it's about you know having a, a sense of being together and not just doing the job you know as well as doing the job and paying people well of course but like you know if, if you don't have a good fit it can be really hard to do the work so I was really thankful to find Isaac I got to work with Samson Brown who I haven't worked that much with before I got to work with uh, Emily Zimmerman who is somebody who I actually you know went to grade nine with but uh, you know we, we've not stayed in touch necessarily but 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 she's a, a performer and an actor in Hamilton and uh, and I was like oh my gosh we, we're actually looking for this like an exactly you character 
for this piece, would you consider coming on? So also getting to reconnect with people that I, I haven't worked with in a long time. So uh, to me, it's sort of a bit of a mix of the excitement and fun of finding new people to work with, but the joy of getting to work with my community and to really build this work as like, this is an archive, you know, this work is an archive of activism in this moment. It's an archive of the people, the places, the things. Um, and so getting to work with these people who are doing this work feels really special. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and it translates as very genuine. I think that's what's so beautiful about the work, um, because it is authentic. It is genuine. So thank you. Um, if no one else has a question, maybe, yes, we do have Hi. one. How are you? Hi. I'm Lillian. Um, I have a question for Christian. Uh, I'm always intrigued about the, the way you can work the memory with the South American Chilean situation not being political, not being involved in political. And I know right now you're doing an exhibition in Chile. Um, what is the what is the situation right now after the last uh, elections? What is your sentiment there? What is the reaction of people? Uh, being myself from South America, I know what it is to live in a country where there is such a big gap in uh, in communities, and uh, and you try to react in a way, but uh, you know that. Maybe that's not the, I don't know how to explain it. It's uh, it's if you have a chance to, to get to something when you don't have the, the um, you see, right now in Peru, there is a government that it's not the, the best choice of everybody, but my idea always comes to a point where, well, you, you have to accept your government, but you have to help them also to work for everybody. And right now I'm seeing this dislocation in South America where the new governments that are coming into power, um, they want to dislocate themselves from others. And is that the right response? Uh, um, Christian is working on, uh, on memory that you, you're accounting for things that people told you, okay? As I grew up with that situation, I grew up seeing on TV the Allende situation and, and, and everything. Myself, I lived through a time of a, a dictatorship uh, government and a coup d'etat and, and everything that has to do with, uh, with changes, you know? And, um, and it seems that the generations that come to, to, uh, to grow and to try to come into an activist point, they don't see in the in the they don't see back what happened to make things work the, in a better way you know um, as if i give you an example uh, yeah i grew up as a teenager also uh, rebelling against the against the government and 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 doing things to be an activist what I see that was wrong, nothing happened, okay? And I'm talking 40 years later, you see the same things happening and to what solution? So that's, I'm, I'm always intrigued of what do, you, what do you do with the memory, working on the memory when things don't change in the, in the future? Uh, the same as what Cyrus is saying is just conversing on this video of people in the future uh, 
imagining that things have changed, you know? But uh, what is that we're doing right now that brings people together? It's not ones against the other ones. It's how do you bring them together? How do you, where do you find that fine line that you see the, the higher classes thinking about the lower classes and the lower classes maybe thinking we need to learn something from, from the other side? I don't know, I don't know. Okay, um, why don't we leave some time for uh, that, the answer from Christian? Um, my connection was cut enough, so I'm not sure if I if I got all your questions. Uh, Lily, how are you? Uh, I know Lily, um, Lily, um, it's um, here the situation is different. The pandemic is kind of over. People are on the street. There's a different kind of energy. However, uh, the election also um, provided another another kind of tension. Um, there's a lot of people that were, um, I'm, I'm, we're, we're talking here about, um, we just had a, a, um, an election system to decide into a new proposal, a new draft for a new constitution. People in what, and to the election oh. to write a new constitution, it was around 80% of the people voted in favor of writing a new constitution. And now uh, most of the people actually rejected the the the, the new proposal of the constitution. Um, so like the election went all against. Yeah, people were in favor of a, a year a, a year ago. So there's a lot of still a, still a lot of tension. And I think in history in Latin America, there's there's always like like everywhere else in the world, there's going to be a cycle of things. So in, in the next 40 years, there's more things going to happen. And I don't think we're, we're ever going to be as stable as other countries. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I think here, at least in Chile, we had, we had, that's, this is my point of view, we had a really good possibility with this election, with it, we write a new constitution that for me, um, was, was a little bit more balanced for everyone. And now we're back into uh, what I see now, for example, in the news is that right wings uh, politicians have the more, more of a say to write a new constitution. We're gonna get a new constitution written. However, it's gonna be more balanced towards uh, companies and less towards the people. This is the way I see it. Obviously diff there's different points of view everywhere. Uh, other issues in the next few years, um, and even though I'm hoping things are going to get better, not everything's going to get better. Um, and probably, you know, if the other constitution, the draft that people rejected, if that one got accepted, same things was going to happen. That's what that's what was probably like changes were going to happen in ten more years or so. Uh, things don't 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 come fast. Um, I think less in Latin America that everything is, is much more uh, and and again what you were saying some something big is going to happen in, in 30 more years you know and little things are going to happen in between as well um, sadly Latin American things are like that yeah so 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 in that in that sense be an important fact of the things that are happening here yeah well you're cutting off Christian a little bit so we can wrap up that question I'm sorry um there was some technical uh issues we only have a couple of minutes left and I noticed there was some chat going on there and it was responded thank you Cyrus for responding that quickly um Yanis, I think you have another question and that will be the final as long as it's just a very short question Yes, hi everyone. Now my question is very simple, uh, very uh, directly to Christian. Um, I would like to say thank you for this uh, talk. I really love and enjoy it. And I know that it was uh, uh, work and I follow uh, in Instagram. Um, the question is for Christian. And did you say that you work with uh, wood? And I really love that. I am a photographer as well, myself. 
And I really love the texture and also the story behind the working with wood and magnet, no, do you say? And print the photo, many layers. Uh, I think that's so powerful. And yes, I wanna say uh, how you will keep going with this technique because I think it's a lot to explore there. That's my question, thank you. So Mark, I think my connection is, is, is so I'm going to be brief um, with this. I think this is the first time that I allow myself to manipulate film photography. Uh, and, I all, and, and, I, and I basically use medium format and large format photography. And I allow um, basically the negatives to speak for, for themselves. I try not, I, I never manipulate photos or anything like that. And in this case, I'm not manipulating, but I'm details of the print. Um, I think I think it was for that specific reason. I don't think I'll I'll, I'll continue doing for other projects that type of work. Thank you. Yeah, it's so, so, so sad because it's, it's beautiful. It looks thank really you so much. wonderful. Well, thank, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. I'll leave a few minutes at the end here to wrap it all up uh, with Cecilia, but I just wanted to. Thank Cyrus and Gritian for not only participating in the exhibition, but also uh, sharing your work with us in this platform. Thank you so much. Thank you all for you. coming tonight. Um, thank you, Cyrus and Gritian, for being with us as well. I know you both have busy schedules, and we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to be with us. Um, yeah. Uh, be sure to keep in touch with us at Sir Gallery, and I hope to see you all at our exhibition in person, The People United, uh, which is currently on view until November 26th, um, curated by the Mara Toledo, uh, with the Beehive Collective, Colectivo Las Teses, Carlos Colin, uh, Cristian Ordonez, and Cyrus Marcus Ware or at our next event, which is the Mesoamerica Resiste workshop with the Beehive Collective, which is actually this Saturday, in person from one to three, um, as well as our next online event, which is the Latin American Speaker Series with Colectivo Las Tesis on October 27th at seven. Um, please note that if you wish to visit the gallery in the coming weeks, we are open on Thursdays and Fridays, 12 to 6, and on Saturdays from 11 to 5. For a full listings of the exhibition programming, please visit our website, and there are links on our websites that will help you register for those events. If you would like to receive information about these or other events we organize, I urge you to contact us to be added to our newsletter as well as follow us on social media with the handles at Sir Gallery on most platforms and uh, at Lacap Arts on Twitter. And without further ado, there are no other comments. Um, I bid you all a good night. And again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, everyone. Bye, thank you. Bye.